Good morning. And welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Christian Marquardt. Very good to have all of you here this morning. Um, For those of you who were here last week, I was not here. I'm sorry. My wife and I went camping in way up north Wisconsin. Uh, We were up on Madeline Island, so we were all the way up to Lake Superior. We saw the worst 4th of July parade ever. There was a guy dressed up as an eagle, and he was in a float that was clearly a pelican that had been painted to look like an eagle. And the poor children were standing there on the sidewalk. They had sidewalk chalk they had written. On the sidewalk, they wrote, throw candy. Please give us candy. They wrote circles. Throw candy right here. There was no candy. Maybe next year. In our service this morning, we're going to have a couple readings and even hymns that talk about the idea when ministry is really challenging, when it's really hard to follow God, when we ask for things but don't get what we ask for, and how we can know that God still loves us in those moments. We're going to get started with our opening hymn, which is printed as an insert in your service folder. The title is Day by Day, and you will also find the words displayed on the screen if you'd like to follow along that way. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen.
Just as we're getting started this morning, I realize there's two big things that I forgot to announce. One of them, you may have noticed on your way in, the offering baskets are not there. That's because we'll be collecting the offering during the service, um, as we used to do for so many years. Additionally, instead of offering continuous communion, we will have rail communion this morning. And as we get closer, I'll have further instruction just to remind you what that looks like during the service. But for now, we're going to get started with the service of word and sacrament, which is found on page 26. In the front of the red hymnal, the words are displayed on the screen. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2. And these words are really important for us because we see the beginning of the ministry of one of the prophets. Now, all the prophets began their ministries in slightly different ways, but a common thing that they heard was, your ministry is going to be very challenging because I'm sending you to my people to tell them to repent. And anyone who has ever had to go and tell someone to repent knows that is very difficult to do. It's difficult to do so in a loving way, but it's even difficult just to get up the courage to go and do it in the first place. And God tells Ezekiel, I'm sending you to some of the worst people on the face of the earth. They are my people, and I love them, but they are very sinful. But I want you to go and speak my word. I want you to go and tell them exactly what I want them to know. And whether they listen or not, they will know that it was God's word spoken among them. A reading from Ezekiel chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This will also serve as the text for our sermon later on in the service, so I won't talk too much about it right now. But these words are really important. Just as Ezekiel found out that his ministry was going to be very challenging, God often gives us circumstances and even allows things to happen to us that make our lives harder. That's not to say God doesn't have a purpose in it, and that's not to say God still isn't strong. Um, In fact, sometimes God lets us be weak to remind us that we still need him. A reading from 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Happier are they who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with patience. Alleluia. 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 Words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Gospel reading for the seventh Sunday after the Pentecost comes from Mark chapter 6. The reading begins at verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown. 
accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. This is the Gospel of our Lord. May be seated. Our worship continues with the singing of our next hymn, Lord of Our Growing Years. You'll find that printed um, in, near the back of the red hymnal. That's hymn number 507.
to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Two weeks ago, I took us through the book of Job. I mean, really, I just went through 11 verses, but I also kind of went through the entire book, the entire story of Job, as Job was a man who was suffering. It was a suffering that God had permitted to happen, and Job was upset. And he asked God, God, how could you let this happen to me? How could you be so unfair? I want answers, God. I want you to tell me why this is happening. And then I want you to take it all away. And as we went through the book of Job, we realized that even though some things Job said about God were correct, his attitude, and certainly his tone with talking to God, was wrong. We don't get to demand answers of God. We can look for them. We can seek them. We can ask for God to give us exactly what we're looking for. But sometimes he doesn't. And not only did Job find that out, the apostle Paul found that out. And sometimes people ask me to pray for them um, as though I have some special direct line to God. And my prayers, they just go better to God than anybody else's. Um, as though an average, ordinary person, their prayers can only go so high. But if you really want God to hear your prayer, a pastor's got to do it. Well, if that's true of me, and it isn't, but if it was true of me, it would certainly be even more true of the Apostle Paul. Certainly, if the Apostle Paul prays to God, God answers that prayer and gives Paul what he asked for. That is not what happened. Paul says, I prayed to God three times. I begged him. I entreated him. I said, God, take this away from me. And he didn't. And there's a reason he didn't. There's a few reasons he didn't. So what we're going to do is figure out what are the reasons God wouldn't take that away. We're going to try to figure out what the thorn in his flesh was or how it relates to us. And then we're also going to be reminded that even though I am weak, Christ is strong, and that's the main point. We start in the middle of a section, really. We start in verse 7, and if you've got a different translation than the one that I have, it might even start in the middle of a sentence. Because Paul has been talking about, uh, he's been talking about the idea of boasting. And he starts out by comparing his ministry to that of uh, the ministries of other um, apostles. They called themselves apostles. Maybe they were even better apostles than Paul. There were these people who had this ministry, and they started having people follow them instead of Paul. And in general, Paul didn't care about that, but he was saying, these people that you're following are taking you down the wrong path. They should not be bragging about themselves or boasting about their own accomplishments as though they're anyone to follow. And he says, but if you want to hear me brag, here's what I'm going to brag about. He said, I, I, I know a man, and clearly he's talking about himself. He says, I know a man who had a special vision from God. He was caught up to the third heaven. And the way that this is different from our scientific way of talking about the world, but the Jewish people talked about three heavens. The first heaven is just the sky around us the place where the birds fly. The second heaven is outer space. That's where the planets are. And the third heaven must be even further than that. That's where God is. That's what we call heaven now. Paul says, I know somebody who is caught up to the third heaven, and he heard God speaking directly. Paul saying, that happened to me. And that was not the only thing that Paul could have bragged about. He he had a really good background. He had been educated in the faith. He had been persecuted for his faith. He had done all of this. And then he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these great revelations. Because he had some kind of vision or whatever happened to him, and he got to see God and hear God, and he got to be in heaven, however it happened exactly. Paul says, because these wonderful things were happening to me, God did not want me to become conceited. In fact, even though it's, we can't tell it just from our English text, he says it twice in the Greek. He says that at the beginning, God did not want me to exalt myself. He says that at the beginning, and then he says it at the end. 
That's the point. That's why God allowed this to happen to him. Because Paul had access to special knowledge, had special spiritual experiences that most other people hadn't had, God said, I'm going to let this happen to you. Or did he give Paul the thorn in the flesh? It's kind of unclear. Paul says, it was given to me. It doesn't say who gave it. And this has been an eternal debate among Christians. Does God send evil? Does God just permit evil to happen to me? We will not answer that 2,000-year-old, 3,000-year-old, 4,000-year-old question by looking at this verse today. Because you know what? It doesn't even say. A thorn was given to me in my flesh. A messenger of Satan. You know what the word messenger is in Greek? It's angel. An angel of Satan was sent to me to torment me. And God did not take it away from Paul. Paul says, three times I pleaded to the Lord to take it away from me. And he said, no, I will not. I'm going to let you have that thorn in your flesh from now until the day you die because it's helpful for you. That's not usually the way we think about it. It's helpful for me. It's advantageous for me to have some kind of limitation. But that's what God said. So let's try and figure out what exactly this thorn was, because there are basically two big ideas that have been suggested. The first one is that it was some kind of physical ailment, that Paul had some kind of sickness, he had some kind of disability, something bad had happened to him, and he wasn't at his former full strength. And there's a couple of verses that people will point to to try to prove that point. They will point to Galatians 4, verse 13, when he tells the people, you know that when I preached among you, the only reason I preached to that group of believers in the first place, the only reason I brought the gospel to them was because of a sickness. Later on in, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, there's this kind of a weird verse. It just pops up out of nowhere. He says, see what big letters I write to you as I write with my own hand. The reason he wrote that is because he was writing with his own hand. That makes sense, right? That's what he said. When Paul wrote his other letters, he didn't just write down by hand. He dictated them, and someone else wrote them down. And now Paul, apparently as he's writing a couple sentences by himself, he's using really big letters. So some people have speculated, perhaps, Paul had bad eyesight. Maybe that was his thorn in the flesh. Maybe he had a degenerative eye condition. Maybe his eyes um, were always blurry. Maybe he had conjunctivitis. Maybe he had cataracts. I don't know. There's been a lot of speculation over trying to figure out one little verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And if that wasn't enough, the chapter before gives us plenty of ideas. If it was a physical ailment, where it could have come from? Because as Paul is bragging, (laughs) bragging, as Paul is talking about the persecutions that he's gone through, this is what he says. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from... My own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. (laughs) From all of those experiences, there are plenty of physical problems that could have come up. Paul said he was stoned. We read about that in the book of Acts. The people threw rocks at Paul to kill him, and they thought he was dead. And they left him there on the ground, and Paul got up, and he went back into the city. People who are trying to execute you 
who don't just dislike you but openly hate you and are trying to kill you because of that, usually do not mess up like that. There are many things that we could point to and say, I think this is what Paul's talking about. I think he's talking about a physical problem. I think this is where it came from. We do not know. And it's good that we don't know. Because this same thing happens to us. You know, in a lot of our sermons, we talk about the law and gospel. And in a lot of, a lot of sermons, the law is, God's law is this, you have fallen short. That's not what it is in this text. That's not what Paul is saying here. He's not saying you have fallen short. He's saying something bad happened to him. It's not just that we are sinful. The world around us is sinful. And so bad things happen to us all the time. Sometimes people get really sick. Sometimes people get hit by cars. Sometimes people lose their jobs. Sometimes people get cancer. Sometimes children get cancer. People have all sorts of health problems that come onto them what seems to be before their time. And the question is, God, will you please take this away from me? Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes he says no. But some people think Paul is not talking about a physical problem. They think Paul is talking about persecution. And not just from outsiders, but from his own people. In fact, if you paid attention during some of those earlier readings in the service, um, apparently the people who put all those readings together, I, it wasn't me, some, whoever did that, thought that all those readings went together they, because the first reading was certainly about persecution. God said, Ezekiel, I'm going to send you not to somewhere far away. I'm going to send you to your own people, and they're not going to listen to you. And when Jesus was beginning his ministry, he went to his hometown. He went to people that knew him as he grew up. He went to his own people, and they didn't listen to him. And so some people think Paul went to his own people, and they didn't listen to him. And we know that Paul faced persecution. We know that Paul had to correct Peter at one point during his ministry. In 2 Timothy, Paul talks about some of the people who opposed him. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he talks about somebody named Alexander the metal worker. Paul says, he's done me a lot of harm. And he says what is maybe the strongest thing a Christian could ever say about anybody. He says, may God repay him for what he did to me. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talks about two other people whose names are Hymenaeus and Philetus, and apparently they had been spreading false teaching among the people. Some people think, some scholars think, that when Paul is talking about a thorn in his flesh, he's talking about a specific person. He said, well, the text says a messenger of Satan. It's probably a person who's tormenting Paul. Maybe. Throughout the course of our lives, we will have many people that torment us, sometimes from our own churches, sometimes from our own families. And the people who are supposed to build us up and encourage us are the people who take the most out of us. And you want to know what I think? You want to know what I think the thorn in Paul's flesh was that God allowed to come to him? Here's what I think. I don't know. And despite what the scholars think, they don't know either. And if any of you come up to me after the service and say, I know, you're wrong. You don't know. And that's good. Because all of us can relate to this verse. It's not just that we are sinful, but others are sinful around us, and the world is sinful, and Satan opposes us, and he wants to stop us on our mission. And so he will do whatever he can. He'll, he'll take our health away. He'll send opposition. He'll send our own people to persecute us, anything to demoralize us and distract us and confuse us. Satan wants to do that. He still has thorns in our flesh today. 
And that's why the good news in this section comes from God. God says, the good news is not that I will take all your problems away. The good news is that I overcome them. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It can be easy to forget that God is powerful when we feel strong by ourselves. But when we're weak, when we can only rely on God, then we remember how big and strong he is. God does not have problems like like we do. God does not have good days and bad days like we do. God does not get short-tempered. God does not refuse to forgive. God does not hold grudges. God loves us. God sent his son to die for us. And God overcomes all of our enemies. A messenger of Satan? Jesus overcame Satan. Jesus doesn't care about the messenger. He's overcome the boss. You do not have to do that. God has done that. You do not have to be perfect in strength and ability. God is able to do that. And sometimes it can be helpful for us to remain weak and remember that Christ is strong. And the important thing that Paul says he's learned about this entire experience. He started by talking about people who boasted about abilities, people who were better speakers than Paul, people who were better writers than Paul, people who said that their ministry was better than Paul for this reason or that reason. I'm sure all the reasons were no good. But Paul said, I'm not going to boast about my ministry, my abilities, what I can do. I'm going to boast about my weaknesses because that shows more clearly how strong God is. Something that Christians have been doing for far too long is bragging about their own abilities. Here's what I did. Here's what I accomplished. Here's the ministry that I started by myself. I got it turned around. I did it all. I took care of it. Here's when my health was bad. I recovered. I was able to do that. I didn't need anybody's help. No. Don't tell people that. People will start to get the idea that they should be strong all the time, they should be healthy all the time, that everything should be easy when it's often hard. Paul says, I'm going to boast about when I'm weak, when I'm not able, when I'm sick, because the second half of that is, and God was still there with me. So that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. May all of us get to that point where when God says no, we don't get angry, we don't fight, but we remember, I have often been weak. God never has. And if his strength is all I have, his strength is really also all I need. Amen. Amen. Our worship continues with the words of the Nicene Creed as we join together in confessing our faith, the one that unites us together as believers. You'll find that on page 31 in the front of the red hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our service continues with prayer. Please stand. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your Son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace, and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions in a moment of silent prayer. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Our worship continues on page 36. We stand for thanksgiving. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Once again, good morning, everyone. A couple of things to announce. Well, I've got several things to announce, but the first couple are just things that are going on this week. First of all, our Bible study is happening following the service. Uh, we are finishing up our talk about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll move on to talking about love in 1 Corinthians 13 and seeing exactly what kind of love are we talking about, what kind of love is displayed or should be displayed among God's people. Um, later on in this week, there is the funeral service for Kathleen Capuano. Uh, she passed away, I believe it was, uh, it's two weeks ago now since she passed away on a Monday, but the funeral is coming up this Saturday at July, uh, Saturday, July 17th, F visitations at 11, funeral is at 12.30 p.m. All of you are welcome to come to that. I believe also after the service, once again, the Schaefers have brought something to share. Is that correct? Awesome. We gotta get that sign-up sheet going again. We, they keep just bringing stuff. I didn't tell them to do it. They just decided to do it. Uh, so that'll be in the gathering place following the service. They have once again brought a treat. They're very generous. Thank you for doing that. It's very nice. I would like you to welcome somebody special, somebody who has been coming to St. James for quite a while by now, um, who has taken part in groups and has gone through membership classes with me. Our membership classes do not go real quick, but even though they take a little bit longer than some other churches, people always tell me, I, I appreciate going through these things, being reminded of these things, and learning a lot of new stuff. Um, Peg Broker is our newest member. Peg, are you still here? Can you stand up? You said you'd stand up. Please stand up, Peg. We're very happy to have Peg join us, um, although in many ways she's already sort of joined us quite a while ago. Um, if you haven't met Peg yet, please say hi to her, give her a, a greeting. Um, certainly good to have her among us in our group of believers here at St. James. Uh, coming up next Sunday and for the next several Sundays after that, we've got a sermon series coming up. We're going to be looking at several different readings from the book of Ephesians and talking about what it means to be a family of faith. Um, so that'll be nice to do that. We'll be having different themes. We'll try to include some additional different music that we're not used to yet. Always good to have variety. And uh, if you can switch to the next PowerPoint slide, I have something exciting. You may or may not remember that guy, but he was uh, an early field training student from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. Basically what that means is as guys are going through their years of education, they get assigned to churches to get experience. And that's Mr. Joshua Bush with his wife Lillian. And that is a new member of the family. That is James Robert Bush. He was born January 19th. Um, I had reached out to Josh about two months ago and he finally texted me back. He said, it's been really busy, but I wanted everybody to know about this. Um, I'm sure they were, some of them were curious what was going on with me. That's what's going on with him. And that's, it's kind of funny because that's the same church I was sent to um, like six years ago now. So it's cool to see him there and uh, we'll look forward to having him come back. Maybe he'll come back. Um, I'll get to see him again. I don't know if you will, but hopefully. And then I do have one other announcement and it has to do with the way that our church body functions, not just our church, St. James, but connected to broader churches. There are actually two pastors being installed in services this afternoon, one at Centennial Lutheran Church, um, one at Old Salem. Well, or, sorry, not Salem, Old St. John's. They used to call it Old St. John's. Now they call it St. John's on the hillside, but they're both getting pastors installed there, uh, which is really exciting. The way that our church body works, when a pastor gets assigned somewhere, um, he has to stay there for at least four years before he gets a call. And so a new guy just got assigned to St. John's in the Hillside, and Lord willing, he'll be there for at least four years, and then he'll receive a call, and then he'll have to deliberate what God's will is for him. I've been at St. James for four years. That means I'm eligible to receive a call. And basically what that means is churches can reach out to me and say, we have heard about some of your abilities and some of your gifts and the things that you're interested in. We'd like you to be our pastor. That can happen. Uh, in fact, it did happen. This past Tuesday, 
I received a call from Brooklyn Lutheran Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and I sent them a letter acknowledging that I have received their call. I, Lord knows what's going to happen, but this is the letter that is read in their congregation this morning, probably in like 45 minutes from now. So I'm going to read that to you, and then I welcome whatever input you have um, after the fact. Dear members of Brooklyn Lutheran Church, this past Tuesday evening, your church president, Mike Boyd, reached out to me with the news that you have extended a call to me to serve as your pastor. It is an honor to receive a call and a privilege to consider serving between two different fields of ministry. I'm glad to hear about God's work being done among you and your own efforts to establish a vision to reach your neighbors with the gospel message. Over the next several weeks, I will be in prayerful consideration of two calls, both the call to my current congregation that I hold as well as this new call to Brooklyn. Just as you sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit in extending me this call, I also seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit in deliberating. Your own prayers for me and my wife as we consider this life change are welcome. Additionally, any other helpful input you have is also welcome. Feel free to reach out to me with your thoughts. I will continue to learn more about Brooklyn Lutheran to best see how my time, talents, and energy can be used for the good of God's kingdom. And before just now, the only person who knew about that, to my knowledge, was Tim Meister, because I had to, that's protocol, you call the head elder right away. So this is, I've received this call, I will now be deliberating this for the next several weeks. Um, any in, I'm hearing input from them, I'm, any input that you have is also certainly welcome, and uh, we will continue to go being led by the Spirit, certainly. So things coming up after the service, things coming up later on this week. And uh, certainly keep Danny and I in your prayers and whatever input you have, like I said, is welcome. So God's blessings to all of you. I will greet you at the door and uh, have a good day.